My name is Penn Gillette, and this is Trailers from Hell, and the trailer we're about to see is a trailer for a movie called Look, or as I call it, Adam Rifkin's Look, because the word look is pretty useless on the internet. It's everywhere. So Adam Rifkin's Look. I had not heard of Adam Rifkin. I had not seen his other great movies, and he's done a lot of them. I was interested in found footage movies, and a friend uh, recommended Look. It's my favorite movie of this century. As time goes on, it may be my favorite movie ever. So the movie postulates, this is never said outright, but it's, it's implied, that we have some sort of intelligence, whatever that is, that has access to every single lens that we're being photographed in and is able to uh, bring together the story. So every piece of information that you get from look could be gotten through a security camera. Now, if you go out with Adam, the first time you meet Adam and you talk about look, and he will point to the cameras that are around. It's, it's a really cute little sexy quality he has. He'll say, see, we're being watched there, we're being watched there. And he points out how much, when, we made the, how, when he made the movie, how much we were on camera. And now it's even more. There are security cameras everywhere. You're on camera all the time. And Adam's very aware of that. Now, you would think that look would be a movie whose subject was surveillance. You would think that the idea of look would be the transparent lives we live in public from these cameras. What makes look not an interesting movie, but rather a great movie, what makes it more than an intellectual exercise, but rather really profound and deep. The reason you want to keep looking and thinking about look is that the surveillance thing doesn't matter. That is an intellectual conceit that he is done with within the first five minutes of the movie. He wrote Look and he directed it. I don't think one person could write it and one person direct it because Adam's sublimation of the director ego, directors always want to tell the audience how to perceive the actors. You know, Brian De Palma, you know, just all that kind of stuff. Adam doesn't do that. Adam lets the actors work and lets the script work and lets the overall concept work, but doesn't tell you. You know what I hate about badly directed comedy, badly directed especially uh, TV situation comedies, is they tell you where the joke is. I say something, we see his or her reaction, that's where the gag is, right? Don't let the actors work. The uh, Martin and Lewis stuff, the Marx Brothers stuff, is all done in two shots. So I decide when I want to make that look. Because there's no director good enough to know exactly when the look goes from Groucho to Chico. You've got to have it in two shot. No one can tell when the Smothers Brothers. You can't pop back and forth on who's doing the joke. Because when you've got a straight man and a comedian, um, you don't know exactly who is handling the joke at each second. It's not a sports thing where you throw the ball and that person's in control then. The, the person that's setting it up still keeps setting up all the punchlines delivered. That's been talked about forever. Everybody knows that. There's smart stuff written about that. But everyone seems to accept the fact that the director can treat their audiences like idiots and say, this is the person whose heart's being broken now. This is what it looks like for their heart to be broken. Drama tells you what the person is feeling and who is feeling it and how we're supposed to see it on their faces. Drama does that. Comedy is two shots, drama is close-ups. What that means, the way drama's been shot all the time, is that the camera is inside the scene. The camera has permission to be there. If I'm doing a scene where I'm talking to someone at a cafe and the camera comes in like this, that's telling you that the camera has permission to sit in that seat. What Adam did was break a deeply profound rule of movies. Um, the rule of the fourth wall is no big deal. Everyone breaks that. Crossing the line, everyone breaks that. But the rule that dramas like this, even Rope, all done ostensibly in one shot, the Hitchcock movie, comes in close. You can talk about Kubrick, you can talk about Altman, you can talk about all that stuff. They still don't have balls the size of basketballs that says 
Our actors will do the scene here, we'll put the camera here, and just let it go. So the feeling you get is wireistic, but not in the simple political sense of there are cameras all over, but in a real emotional artistic sense. By moving the camera to some place it could actually be, by not giving the camera emotional permission. Shot like this, you've automatically given the camera emotional and theoretical permission to be in that scene. By taking the permission away, the camera and the director are not allowed in the scene. The camera's up on the wall, the camera's in the ATM, the camera's over here. By doing that, we are really watching the actors in something that gives it a reality that's really, really deep and profound. Look allows us to watch a story without the permission to be there. The feeling you get is this feeling that trust has been violated. And then Adam is smart enough and creative enough to make the plot echo that in a way that's non-linear. So the plot is this deep betrayal within society of the, of the monster, the horror figure in this. And how, I'll give you a little hint, spoiler alert, how she uses that violation of trust uh, to destroy somebody. Look was made for almost no money. I mean, uh, uh, Adam did Underdog. He wrote Underdog. And as an atonement, which we sometimes do, I took the money I made from Miami Vice and started a punk record label because I had to get rid of that blood money. Whatever Adam's reasons were, he wanted to get rid of some of the money from Underdog. And uh, he used that money to make look. Now, in reality, he didn't shoot it with security cameras. Uh, that was considered. He considered just going and doing it and then just copping the footage and putting it together, which is a wonderful idea in the way the pitch should have been done. He actually shot it with big, fancy-ass, expensive cameras and then spent hundreds of thousand dollars degrading it to shitty, to shitty uh, quality. But uh, fine. That's just the nuts and bolts. Uh, Adam Rifkin would look moves the whole thing up into security cameras, moves it into a kind of space that we're not given permission to watch, and then tells us a horrific, smart, beautiful story. All that having been said, it's also got naked women, <laughs> and it's really funny. He didn't need any of that. He had a good enough movie before that, but he just put the, the frosting on the cake. Look is probably the best movie ever made. Hi, I'm Penn Gillette. This is Trailers from Hell, and we're going to talk about Adam Rifkin's look. I'm fascinated by the idea that although uh, novels have long masqueraded as something else, diaries, journals, uh, bulletins, newspapers, 